Okay, so I'm really pleased and excited to introduce our, our ending keynote before our champagne reception. And our ending keynote is Adrian Harris. Adrian's currently the chief business officer at a California startup called State's Title. I'm sure she'll tell you what that company does. Prior to that, uh, she was an advisor for economic policy in the Obama administration, especially focused on innovation. So very exciting person to have here to close out this conference today. So, Adrian. Is she in the, in the wings? Come on out. Come on out. Yep, go for it. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I have sort of the unenviable task of being between you all and cocktails, so I'm going to try and be uh, very brief. But um, thank you to Stern and to Professor DeRose for, for having me. It's always good to come back to Stern and to New York. I don't get here enough now that I'm based on the West Coast, but I love coming back uh, to my alma mater to, to hang out with everybody here. Well, so I think Matt this morning set the stage very well in talking about the context of FinTech and different areas um, where he saw the trend setting. I'm going to spend my time with you all today. We're going to be a little interactive. I hope that's okay. I know everybody's tired. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about an area of FinTech that's near and dear to my heart, which is financial health. So just to set this stage a little bit, uh, according to the Federal Reserve of New York's uh, recent microeconomic data survey, household debt in the U.S. has recently hit $13.2 trillion. A big part of that, not surprisingly, is student loan debt, which has been about steady at $1.4 trillion. Auto loan balances have been increasing by $9 billion in the last quarter to $1.24 trillion. And credit card balances earlier this year rose by $14 billion. In the context of this rising debt, however, it's probably not that surprising to this group that the vast majority of Americans still have not saved enough for retirement. According to Northwestern Mutual, 21% of Americans have nothing saved for their retirement. And another 10% have less than $5,000 saved. On the plus side, about a quarter of Americans have more than $200,000 stashed away. And so the average comes out to be about $85,000 saved for retirement by the average American. But experts say you need about $1 million stashed away to be secure in your golden years. Here's a fact that I know has become popular to quote since it was published several years ago in The Atlantic uh, from the Fed. When asked what they would do if they needed to produce $400 in an emergency, 47% of Americans said that they would need to borrow or sell a possession or they wouldn't be able to come up with $400 at all. Making matters worse. Sorry, I'm like the, the bearer of bad news late here in the afternoon. Money fights are the second leading cause of divorce after infidelity, prompted mostly by debt and lack of communication. We'll come back to that point uh, shortly. The National Bureau of Economic Research recently produced a study saying that people that have more debt report higher levels of stress and depression. And just the feeling of economic insecurity that you might lose your job, that you might not have enough savings, causes people to report pain more frequently and to report increased use of over-the-counter painkillers. Other research shows that people with more financial stress have higher incidence of poor health markers, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and early death. And 65% of people report losing sleep over money. So why come in the afternoon right before cocktails to paint such a dire picture? Well, for one, I always find when I come to a group like this of probably relatively well-off people that it's important to take some time to remind ourselves just how dire the situation is for so many Americans and so many people around the world. 
But also, based on these statistics, it's pretty clear that even if you are relatively well off, if you are well educated and attending fancy conferences, you're probably dealing with some financial stress yourself. So this is where we'll get interactive and a little bit personal, if that's OK with people. Um, but because finances are pretty personal, I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes so we can get some honest answers. Yes, I mean it. I see people looking at me like I'm not closing my eyes. Close your eyes. Honor system. We're all friends. We've been here together all day. All right. Let's see. How many people in this room still have student loans? Raise your hand. OK. How many people in this room feel like they have adequately prepared for retirement? Again, OK. If you have kids, 18 or younger, how many of you think you can afford their post-secondary education without supplement? All right. How many people are or have ever in their lives been paycheck to paycheck? How many of you carry revolving balances on your credit cards? Okay. Homeowners, please raise your hands. Wow, New York, that's different. OK, good. How many of you are caring for an aging parent or relative? And based on that, how many of you have had to do some sort of financial rejiggering to provide care for that relative? How many of you have at least six months of savings stashed away? OK. How many of you have experienced financial stress? OK. Two more questions. How many of you have looked at one of your cohorts and said, how can he, she, they afford that? I don't think I could. Instagram's a bummer that way, I think. <laughs> and for how many of you has just thinking through these questions quickened your pulse or induced some sort of stress in your body? OK. Open your eyes. So not surprisingly, this group is, is pretty well off. But you know, the majority of you raised your hand for in response to a lot of these questions. Now, the beauty of me having you close your eyes is I can totally manipulate the results to prove my point, but I promise I haven't done that. Um, you know, We're not calling Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey necessarily to come save the group, but finances are stressful. right? Even if you are well-educated, even if you make more than most, most of you in this room answered in the affirmative to a lot of these questions. So. One thing I think to note is that from a personal perspective, again, even if you're in a higher income class, finances are stressful. But on a positive note, you should know that you're not alone. Hopefully that helps relieve the stress a little bit. You should also know that there's no shame in having to experience some financial stress, do some financial rejiggering not feeling like your Fidelity retirement score is going to be in the green when you log on to see it. There's lots of systemic issues that keep most of us from being better off financially. And there's probably some things that day to day we could all do a little bit better in our lives to add to our financial security. I know that's certainly true for me. I came out of government and I went into a startup and maybe not the best financial decision in the world. So what does all of this have to do with the topics we've discussed here today? Well, as I said, for me, FinTech is particularly interesting insofar as it can help with financial health for people across the income spectrum. It seems, and we've talked a lot about it here today, there are almost endless numbers of products and services and apps for savings and income volatility, subscription cancellation, low fee and no fee retirement accounts, on-demand insurance, student loan refinancing, budgeting, free equity trades, free remittances, and the list goes on. And some of these products are targeted at certain population, the LMI population, or my very favorite, the Henrys, the high earners, not rich yet. But a lot of them 
are applicable to your financial life no matter where you sit on the income spectrum. And a lot of these are using big data and, and AI on the back end to provide these services. But we rely on these machines, right, because they're helpful for us in pattern recognition, prediction, rational decision making. Machines don't know shame. They don't understand taboos. They don't get stressed or engage in aggressive avoidance tactics when it comes to finances. They just help us make better decisions. The data can tell me that I shouldn't buy the new handbag because rent's coming due. The data can tell me that I worked a few extra hours this week, more than I normally do, and so I can stash some of that extra wage away for a time when I'm working fewer hours. The data can tell me that if I round up every purchase I make and put it in a 529 or in a 401k, how long it will take me to increase my financial security or my child's financial security. It can help me find cheaper credit. And this is all great because it works very well with what we know about human behavior. The data exploits the power of defaults. It limits the effects of decision fatigue. It can do arithmetic probably better than most. So the potential for FinTech to better Americans' financial health seems immense. But there are still limits and there are still problems. And I want to make sure we touch on a few of those that stick out most in my mind. Despite the number of wonderful products out there and all the innovations that we've talked about today, a lot of these innovations mirror our financial lives in one key and incredibly suboptimal way. Just like our finances and like our financial data, these products and services are mostly fragmented. Rarely do we hold our entire financial life in a single institution. You've got a Bank of America checking account, an Amex, a Capital One card, a few 401ks that haven't yet been rolled over, a federal student loan, a Quicken mortgage, a 529, and a sock with pennies in the drawer. And even if all your financial life is in one place, in legacy institutions, often the different parts of the bank or the institution can't talk to one another. I had the head of mortgage at one of the biggest banks in the world tell me they can't look at their credit card customers or their checking account customers and offer them lower rates on their mortgage based on what they know about other parts of their financial life, even within the same institution. So we think FinTech might be a helpful tool in helping us resolve some of this fragmentation. But even then, some of you may use Digit for savings. And these aren't endorsements, but examples. You might use Robinhood for trading. Your bank might have a budgeting app. You may look, as I said, at your retirement score on Fidelity, see that it's in yellow, but feel good enough about it to leave it for another day. You've got Trim to tell you that you probably don't need Netflix and Hulu and that it can get you a lower bill for your cell phone. You maybe go to NerdWallet and it tells you that Ally and Marcus have the highest rates for savings accounts today. So you opened one and you funded it with a few hundred bucks, but you never went through the trouble of connecting your Bank of America checking account where your direct deposit goes to this high yield savings account. If you're really, really on top of your FinTech game, maybe you have an aggregator. Mint, if you're an OG. LearnVest, when it still existed. Personal Capital. All of these tools will bring your accounts into one place, and they'll help you categorize expenses. They'll tell you what your net worth is. They're pretty convenient. And sometimes they'll even help find new products for you but they still require you to be diligent enough to go into the app, teach it some categorization, make some decisions, and take action on your own, by and large. 
So here's what I'm really waiting for, and we saw a little taste of it today, which made me really excited as I was sitting in the green room. We're starting to see more of this. Are the services that can understand your full financial situation and your goals, that can make predictions on your behalf, make decisions, and take action. Here's the best savings account for you. Face ID, open it, fund it, done. You need six months of savings. I think you can save $500 a month over the next several years and fund it. Would you like to do this? Yep. Face ID, done. If you really want to be aggressive, you could cut out the Starbucks, save $600 a month, and get there that much faster. That sounds great. Tomorrow morning, the geolocator on your phone knows that you went to see your favorite barista. And just in the middle of your morning greeting to your barista, your phone pings you. Psst, hey, remember that agreement we had? Skip the latte, fund the 529. Now you feel really guilty, right, because you're thinking about your kid. So you sigh and you say, OK. And then your phone pings you again and says, but you've been pretty good. So why don't I go over to Amazon and order you the little Starbucks coffee machine with the cups of your favorite little blend. You can pay for that with two weeks' worth of coffee. This seems like a reasonable compromise, right? Yes, definitely. Face ID, click, done. And then you say, by the way, I've really been meaning to roll over that 401k. Can you help me with that? And your phone says, sure. I've already pulled the right forms from Fidelity or Charles Schwab or whoever it is. Just DocuSign here, and it'll all be done for you. So imagine this. Imagine this data and these products being able to tell you that your renter's insurance is expired. But based on your preferences for deductions and liability levels, that it's found you a new policy that's more cost effective without you having to do the research or making the decisions on your own. And you're thinking, this all sounds pretty good. But we haven't quite reached the point where all this data and AI have gotten us just to this place that it's totally relieved us of the burden of financial decision making and assessment. But we're close. But these innovations, as I mentioned, aren't without their flaws and issues, challenges, and concerns. And the policymaker in me knows that paramount among those is privacy. It all sounds great to have your financial data in one place, your aspirations, your life details. But when you think about combining that in a single point of failure, it's pretty scary. And I think one of the last panelists said, well, it's basically too late. Ship sailed. Sorry. It's already done. It was very disturbing uh, mention of the Wi-Fi network here, even if you're trying to evade the geolocation, you're out of luck. And so then the trick is, how do you put in place the proper protections from a policy perspective, from a product perspective, to make sure that A, your data is kept safe, and B, that it's only used in the ways you want it to be used? Here's another issue or question that I really struggle with, and we'll how many of you in the room are millennials? Okay, so I'll choose my words carefully then. If you hand over this much financial decision-making authority to the machines, will we all become that much less financially literate? And this is where I joke that it relates to the millennials. Full disclosure, I am also a millennial, so before anybody gets upset. But will it be like kids who no longer know how to spell because they've always had spell check. So if we hand over all this financial decision making, will it make us that much less able to make these decisions for ourselves? And then as I thought about that, I thought, well, maybe I don't care that I'm less able to make these decisions for myself. Those of us who have been in the financial health ecosystem for a long time have beat the drum on financial literacy for a while. But the challenge of financial health is only partly a result of the lack of financial literacy. In other words, knowing better doesn't automatically translate into doing better. And that's especially true with your finances and all the stress and decision fatigue that they induce. 
I would argue that financial literacy is less than half the battle. First, you really have to actually have the financial ability to act on these decisions, right? To actually save. You need extra money to be able to do that. And too many people, through no fault of their own, actually don't have the ability to even act on the best financial advice. But even if you do, you still have to be able to execute on your knowledge. And as we've discussed and you've heard up here today, it's particularly difficult when it comes to finances. So having something that takes the stress out of financial decision making and can overcome all of our human inertia in execution seems like the better part of the trade-off, even if we're sacrificing some literacy for it. But in a perfect world, the machines could not only make the decisions, but they could tell us about why they're making the decisions at the same time. The second challenge with this, which is related to privacy, but more generally is just regulation. In this country in particular, our regulatory system is incredibly fragmented. With eight to 10 federal financial regulators on, on the federal level, depending on how you count, 50 state banking regulators, 50 state insurance regulators, things can get tricky. So when you're trying to combine your investment accounts and your checking account and your mortgage and all of these things in one place, getting the regulatory coordination to make those products work together can be very challenging. And then finally, as much as we all like to sit here and think that the machine is objective and the machine is unbiased, it's just not the case. When those algorithms are written by potentially less than diverse populations or just written by humans with their own set of biases and assumptions. They are bound to confuse correlation and causation and make, make it so that certain social biases persist in the financial decision making. So the challenges, I think, are clear. There's lots of benefit to the innovations we've talked about today and that we're seeing in the marketplace, but it's not without its questions, both from a policy perspective and as people are thinking about developing these innovations and these products. But the notion of fintech isn't really new. It's, really, it's been around for a long time, and arguably, if you talk to people who've been in the industry for a long time, they might say electronic trading and the ATM are examples of fintech. The way we currently conceive of it is a bit of a new phenomenon because it was really the advent of mobile technology combined with the post-financial crisis era that spawned this thing that we all now refer to as fintech. It took the combination of these circumstances to really see in a powerful and guttural way that financial services wasn't really serving us all the way it could and the way it should. So in the wake of the financial crisis, we had financial services 2.0 start to emerge, financial services for good. And not just on the consumer and retail side, but on the institutional side. Innovations that are making capital markets more efficient and opening up the payment flows. And as the industry and the ecosystem have matured, things have become less about disruption for its own sake less about getting rid of incumbent institutions altogether, and more about partnering with or becoming part of or similar to some of these institutions, but better. Matt talked a little bit about the trajectory from a very payments and lending heavy space to things that were more insurance and financial infrastructure, balance sheet heavy innovations. So it's become less about destroying the system and more about improving it. And in some ways, we've gone from an ecosystem that was more tech than fin to an ecosystem that's now more equal parts, fin and tech. And there's a lot of great innovations happening. And I was pleased, really, to see so many interesting things and, and witness the discussions today. But if I can leave you with, with one little tidbit before we do some Q&A. I would implore you all as, as faculty, as innovators, as students, not to lose sight of the original sort of genesis of FinTech as we perceive it today. 
it really was driven by wanting to make financial services work for people and work for our economy. Financial services is like the foundation. It's a utility that sits below everything else we do in our lives, from buying a home to funding medical innovations. So without a properly working financial services system, very little else is possible. And FinTech represents a wonderful opportunity to make the economy work better for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, happy to take questions. No questions. Everybody's ready for cocktails. No? I think you have to, they're going to, yeah, you should go up to the mic up there. I've just got a quick question. When I was in grammar school, they celebrated uh, Paul Julius Reuter because Reuter uh, linked the Berlin and Paris exchanges and traded by using carrier pigeons, mm -hmm. which was essentially gave him or his firm a competitive advantage. And he was looked upon as an innovator and a hero at the time. Mm -hmm. Today we have uh, people who are co-locating their servers for transactions next to exchanges because they mm -hmm. get a femtosecond or nanosecond <laughs> jump on the rest of the market. But they're not good people. Mm. What's changed? I'm not sure that much has changed, right? People, I think, have long looked for innovations in financial services for a variety of, of motives, right? And we might look back at the financial crisis and ascribe lots of bad motives to some of the actors there at the time. And then it's very easy, I think, to look to fintech innovators and, and assign good motives to their innovations. Um, and we've seen some examples where that's not necessarily holding true anymore. So I don't know that so much has changed. I think we stopped, in my mind, thinking about financial services as this utility, right? It became a thing in and of itself instead of a, a platform, and I don't mean that in the technical sense, but instead of a platform to help us do other things. And in my mind, it's sort of getting back to that ethos um, is part of what FinTech has done, but something I think we'd all do well to, to think more about in the space. Okay, but there's a moral question that's sort of embedded in this. That's mm -hmm. really what I'd like you to address. There's, we've changed the rules. What was morally laudable in the 1800s, is, or mm -hmm. the late 1700s, before the telegraph, yeah. is now no longer morally laudable. It's just, would you, would you have any observations as to why it's changed? Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I think I'm hearing in your question is a little about regulation or, or laws around <laughs> financial services. I have to say, I... You know, my time in, in government really did give me a, a better and fuller appreciation for just how hard it is to make policy for such a diverse country and a diverse economy. And in fact, when you're a, a global leader in, in many respects, and I don't mean that morally as much as, right, if you think about the financial capital and the complexity of the financial system here in the U.S. versus other parts of the world, um, I think it... I'm going to you know, put aside some of my own partisan thoughts. Um, I do think it is hard to ascribe sort of a moral motivation to a lot of policy making and, and changes we see in regs and, and some of the, the changes we see in behavior. Some, there are clear examples, right? Good and bad, as I mentioned. Um, but when you're trying to make policy and write regs that can fit the diverse set of financial institutions and activities that you want a financial system to undertake, I think it becomes very hard, right, to, to serve all masters. Okay. Thank you. He looks very unsatisfied with that answer. We can talk about it over cocktails. Yeah, we, we can, because okay. the SEC was in favor of it initially, and then they reversed themselves when there was a public outcry. Mm. So, I mean, I, 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 that's all I know. I'm not very thin layer, but okay. Yeah, over more, cocktails. more over cocktails. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you for making the time again to come and visit. Yeah. I am a strong believer in um, hybrid enterprises. Now, for a while, I think the term has been used for nonprofits 
and for profits coming together, but I like to use it with government coming together with the private sector. Absolutely. Now, with your background, um, having been in the Obama administration, now being in a startup, what do you think us as um, founders, as members of the private sector, mm. can do to better work with local federal governments? Um, to make sure that we move in the right direction? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one of my favorite questions and something I spend a lot of time thinking about it. I think for a long time as, as fintech entrepreneurs and founders in particular, people thought this regulatory environment was so onerous right, and so hard to get through and it was really going to stifle innovation. And so there was a lot of thought about how do you avoid, get around, not be subject to regulation. And then and that started to change a little bit as the industry started to shift to more balance sheet heavy activities and, and some more complicated activities. Um, my, my personal view has always been that the engagement between the public sector and the private sector is incredibly important, right? You are trying something new as a fintech startup. You should engage with the right regulatory bodies, right? Talk to them about what it is your goals are and what you're trying to do. Because it's, I think it's rare that people are really trying, right, affirmatively to do bad stuff and ignore regulations, right? People trip. Um, and so I've always found that engagement between the public and private sector, talking about shared objectives, working together um, to get there is, is the good way to go. And I've been, I was, Always very pleased when I was in the public sector when, when private institutions, large and small, would come to me with these problems and we could work through them together. And I've, I've also been very pleased on the other side as, as I'm dealing with regulators every day and in our business we're underwriting title in a way it's never been underwritten before and how open and, and helpful the regulators are in trying to achieve some of our shared objectives. So my, my advice and um, my hope for everybody is that engagement becomes the model for innovators and government. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's amazing. I just want to give you another big hand. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I want to extend that thank you to, to all of you for coming, help us, helping us celebrate FinTech over the course of the day. And a big shout out to all the people who worked really hard in this conference, including Kelly Miller. She's in the room. She deserves a huge hand of round of applause. She's the assistant director of the Fubon Center. And um, I'd like to extend a thank you also to all of our panelists and speakers and people who led luncheon topics and so forth. And of course, our sponsors and uh, the Fubon Center, which without this, uh, would not have made this conference possible. So thank you so much, and please enjoy on us some champagne. <laughs>